1, two weeks ago, managed to get into satellite TV, and it immediately got massive flack by the legacy media. So this is an important step in the German-speaking countries that in normal TV, there is a new medium now present. The other reason for our problems is that most empathetic people simply cannot believe that such evil people really do exist and that the Hitler, Stalins, Maus, etc. have not become extinct but are nowadays are multi-billionaire psychopaths. When I explain the COVID, CO2 or whatever prevailing nonsense narrative to anybody, I usually get the answer, oh nice. Still, I cannot believe that such evil does exist. So the people simply refuse. They see our evidence. Everything is laid in front of them. But they just simply refuse to believe that such evil does exist. And, and I think the reason is this. 2,000 years ago, the people had known that there is good and evil. But most have kind of forgotten this because... We are told that everybody can be somewhat good and evil sometimes, which is not true, of course. A, a, a deeply empathetic person can, for example, cannot kill another person unless he is so much deluded, he or she is so much deluded that he really believes he does something good by killing this uh, uh, someone else. Uh, so I guess it is important to restart the debate about good and evil and to educate the people, not on the childish basis of uh, I am the good guy, you are the bad guy, or even the evil guy, and not on Kant's knowledge from the 18th century, but based on the knowledge mainly provided to us by Robert E. Hare, a Canadian psychologist who in the 1960s examined mass murders in high-security prisons, and he called them psychopaths. These are human beings without empathy, conscience, and remorse. They are a kind of robots programmed on nothing else than maximizing their, uh, their self-interest without having programmed Asimov's law, so without having empathy or, or, or morals. So everybody, I think everybody must understand, simply put that among us, about 98% empathetic people are living about 2% psychopaths. Or I explain it like this, among us about 98% mice are living about 2% cats. Or among us 98% sheep are living about 2% wolves. And the most dangerous ones, of course, the wolves in sheep's clothing. I, I like all these animals, of course. I guess you understand. <laughs> but and another important thing that this neoliberal uh, revolution could succeed or threatens to succeed was the appearance of the age of narcissism. I think currently we are at peak age of narcissism that had started in the late 1970s. And narcissists, and of course also severe malignant narcissists, the term I prefer over psychopaths climbed up in any hierarchy all by itself. I guess I only have to say selfie and uh, you understand what I want to say. Uh, so currently in most positions of power we have narcissistic urban idiots. I mean, look look at those clowns in, in our parliaments. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And, and of course, those are the optimal lackeys of the puppeteers, a bunch of powerful multi-billionaire psychopaths. And the people must realize that the empathetic people have always been ruled by a bunch of psychopaths. In ancient times, they were wearing crowns. Nowadays, they are multi-billionaires. The most wealthy of them do not even appear in the listings of the richest people. There, there is a multi... Uh, uh, in English, it's a, a multi-trillionaire class above the multi-billionaire class that appears in the, in the media, of course. So I think I say for years, it is really important that we start this debate. And this term psychopathy, almost nobody knows this. And of course, this is a, a, they did everything to hide their, their psychopathology from the public. So it's very important that we that we uh, educate the people about this. And once they have understood this, 
they can understand history and our current problems much better. Yeah, well, I, I talk quite a lot. So. Thank. I'm, I'm so pleased to be to be party to and just simply to be listening to to the range of uh, voices and, and comments that are being that are being said tonight. You know, I love I love the fact that um, that um, uh, uh, Dr. Bender is using psychopathy and June Slater uses arseholes, um, mm -hmm. which I think are both very descriptive words of the of the challenge that we find ourselves. Uh, up up against, but I hope uh, I'm I'm sure that all, all the people listening will agree that it's such a this is so valuable to listen to all of these here are, e these points of view all coming from different directions. It's so enriching. Uh, so uh, thank you, thank you so much for that. Moving on uh, now to uh, James Freeman. If you're of there, course, Sean. If, if I may just add, if I may sure. just add, Sean. Sure. Of course, like psychopathy is diagnosed by the psychopathy score, but the most easy method is. Just an asshole, exactly. Everybody understands and <laughs> what it means. This is fun. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, James Freeman, are you there? I'm here, Neil. Good. Go ahead. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm going to be. I'm going to self-promote myself first of all before I get going. Um, to anybody listening, um, I've got a show that goes out um, weekdays, Monday to Friday, twelve to one o'clock. June Slater appears with me every Wednesday, Mitch Feistein. Um, we've got um, Dr. Thomas um, Abinders on um, coming up soon. So, um, so yeah, do, do please listen in on TNT Radio. It's the Freeman Report. Um, first of all, thank you to Sean, Neil, Lawrence and everybody else who's organised this. Um, I know how much work it is that goes into organizing these things and and obviously you know it's at the weekend in people's spare time so first of all thank you for that um to me i think you know we we can sort of divulge into all of the the messages and and what the messages are we should be giving to people and everything else but i think i think the real key actually and i don't think anybody will argue against me on this is um unity um, numbers is how we win this because, as everyone keeps on saying, that there's a lot more of us than there are of them. So I think that has to be the key in terms of unlocking how we win this. And, you know, we, I would probably guess that most of the people listening into this um, Twitter spaces tonight is probably on the right side of politics. So... I really do think that we are missing a trick and actually the answer um, is how we unite um, both sides of the argument, whether it's on you, Les, whether it's the right and left of politics and all of that. I mean, it is why they spend so much time, whoever they are, um, trying to distract and to divide us. It is why they create all of these narratives, because they know damn well um, that if ever the right and the left united to said, you know what, we've got a common enemy um, and we will fight that together. They're screwed. They know that. That's why they spend so much time trying to divide us. So I guess the question is, how do we build the numbers and how do we unite um, the um, right and left? Personally, I think that we, first of all, need... We need to agree some kind of set of principles and values that that will transcend down the arguments, um, a set of revolutionary values and principles. I don't know what you want to call it, that transcends both left and right politics, that, that guides people's behavior when we're talking um, about all the problems that we face so that we're not constantly um, fighting each other. Um, you know, at the end of the day, when I listen to the left and the things that they're fighting against, they're the same things. They're just, they're just slightly different arguments of the same problem, the same adversary. So on the left, they're, they're talking about workers' rights. Um, bit, you know, they want, they, they, they're talking about the unions. They're talking about fat cat bosses taking money, equal rights um, and fair pay and all of these things. Um, but the difference is they see big government um, as the counterbalance to this. Um, whereas on the right here, um, we take the opposite view and we, we think that small government is the answer and we fight for freedom and, and our, 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 um, our, our choice to, to choose, um, if I can put it like that. But at the end of the day, 
we're both fighting the same adversary. Um, it's just that they very clef carefully, um, this is what you know the right and left, blue and red politics is about. It's about creating two sides and then creating a narrative on, on each side that ends up with us all in the weeds fighting each other. So I think we need a call to arms that unites both sides um, and we need leaders, the, the Neil Olivers of the world um, and the others, to be reaching out to those people on the left that are um, that are the leaders, the big voices there, um, and trying to, I think, trying to create some common ground. Um, we might not be ready for that yet. I don't know. But things like ULES, for example, is a, is a great example of that um, because it doesn't, you know, nobody gives a toss whether you are vote blue or vote red on, on that principle. It's the fact that it's affecting you. So maybe we need to go further down the road for people to accept um, this. But, you know, the Brexit Party, um, and I hate to bring that up because I know it's divisive, but the reason the Brexit Party did so well and the reason the referendum did so well is because it did transcend the right and left of politics. Um, the Brexit Party, um, you know, I, I think is a misconception that it's a, it was a right wing revolution. Actually, we had more voters from Labour than we did from the Conservatives. Um, and that is why we were successful, because we we found a position that united both sides. Um, so I think that, that I mean, that's what I've got to say, basically. I think that is the key. Um, and I, I don't know how to do that, um, you know, and what, what these values and, 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 and principles are. And, and of course, like all politics, timing um, is, is key on this. You know, we, we can present a certain solution one day, and it won't go anywhere. It, it'll just, it's dead in the water. But in a different context, at a different time, um, it takes hold. And, and like I said, perhaps that context isn't, we're not quite there yet, that people's lives have been affected enough. But I certainly think we should, we should look to the future and, 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 and expect 